Oh, God, four, what's happening? Huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, four forty-five. Yeah, Second Kings twenty-five. I want y'all to look at verse one. This it came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, in the tenth day of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came. He and all his hosts against Jerusalem and pitched against it, and they built forts against it round about. And the city was besieged unto the eleventh year of King Zechariah. And on the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine prevailed in the city, and there was no bread for the people of the land. Now we're sitting here looking about that. He says that Nebuchadnezzar pitched against Jerusalem and besieged around, around Jerusalem. Now we know Jerusalem is what? The city of peace. We know Yahshua is the prince of peace, or the ruler of peace, meaning he would be the king of this city. Let's see if they gather around him. Let's look at John 18. Y'all hold the second Kings 25. Let's see what we can get here. Ah. John 18 and about verse 1. Let's see what we can do here. It says, When Yahshua had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook of Sedron, where was a garden into which he entered, in, entered and his disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Yahshua oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Then Judas, then having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, come hither with lanterns, torches, and weapons. So you're doing full well when they talk about them surrounding Jerusalem. But see, you think the people ain't had no weapons. And then you see they said a band of men. So you know he had quite a few people. If you look at Luke, it says it's a multitude. And you know when you go to talking about multitude, that's a whole lot of people. And they surrounded this man. So you see in the correlation that we got in here, they surrounded this man. Now this is going to make sense in a minute. Let's go back over here to 2 Kings 25. Because see, he had to be taken captive to be able to take captivity captive in order for us to be set free. So this is the reason for why we're dealing with it. If I can get back to 2 Kings 25. Here we go. Now we hear in verse 4. He's saying the city was broken up, and all the men of war fled by night by the way of the gate between two walls, which is by the king's garden. Now the Chaldees were against the city round about, and the king went, uh, went the way toward the plain. And the army of the Chaldees pursued after the king and overtook him in the plains of Jericho, and all his army was scattered from him. So now when we look at this here, he says that the city was broken up and the men of war fled, and that his army was scattered from it. So let's go over here to look at uh, Matthew 26. Matthew 26 is a little better than what we look looking for here. Is that going to talk about the disciples? You better know it. I didn't that. Matthew 26, and about verse 52. We will look at verse 47 and drop down to verse 52. Matthew 26 and 47. And it says, While he yet spake to Judas, one of the twelve came, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and the elders of the people. So again, we're seeing a large amount of people, and they have weapons surrounding the peace. We'll remember that, though. You know, see, Lord, for me, I think we're going to go ahead and throw Absalom in there too, pal, since we keep, peace keep being referred to. I think that's where the Lord wants us to do. Drop down to verse 52. He said, Then said Yahshua unto him, put, again, put up again thy sword in his place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Think thou that I cannot pray to my father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels. You see the faith the son had in his, in his father. He said, You don't think I couldn't call on my father right now, and he sent me some angels to kill every last one of these people. So you have to sit there and look at that in the same way when you're dealing with the Lord, if you're being persecuted, certain things, you've got to know if you're doing what you're supposed to do, he will hear your cries, he will defend you. He will defend you. That's why when these things go down in these last days and these people go to acting a fool, if you die for the word, so be it. But also, if he see fit, like he defended Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, no man can touch you. In the same way he defended Daniel, no man can touch you. So you've got to have that faith and that trust in the living God. And that's why a lot of people be hindered. That means I call my father right now. He sent me a leak. Y'all know how many things is in, in a legion? Y'all know how many angels that is? And he didn't say one. He said one for each tribe. He said twelve of them. That's thousands of thousands of saints coming. So you got to consider that. Now look what he said here in verse uh, 50, 54. Look what he told him. He said, but how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be? He said, here, tell them, because they didn't know. I got to die, fellas. This got to happen. Because if I defend myself and we fight, then the scriptures ain't going to be fulfilled. Now my father is alive. 
Because he said this would happen to me. Look what else he say. He said, in that same hour, Yahshua said to the multitudes, Are you come out as against a thief with swords and staves for to take me? I sat daily with you with teaching in the temple, and you laid no hold on me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. Now, we already dealt with Peter bucking him and why he had that happen. But see, look one more thing I didn't show y'all in Psalm. Go to Psalm 88. We tie Psalms 88. Lord willing, we tie Absalom in here because we've already been rolling on something else, so I ain't going to keep you too long with this one here. I know y'all get tired of me saying that because it always seems to go long. It didn't work itself out. Look at Psalm 88, verse 3. Or, well, matter of fact, verse 1. They ain't a little stankers. He said, Oh, Yah, God of my salvation, I have cried day and night before thee. Let my prayer come before thee, and climb thy ear to my cry. He said, For my soul is full of troubles, and my life draw nigh unto the grave. I am counted with them that go down into the pit. I am as a man that have no strength. Now, when we go back and look, what did he told his disciples? My soul is exceedingly sorrowful unto death. He knew he was going to get ready to die. Look how they line up with it. We need to go look at it. Let's go on and look at Matthew 25, 26, actually, so you can see it again. I mean, we done read this stuff to you in different avenues, but you see the sufferings of the Lord continue to come up. And like I told you, the reason why he's been having us deal with his sufferings repeatedly is because Passover's coming. You need to understand the sufferings of your Savior so that you can be willing to suffer for him. Especially what we read last night about those who Nephthali and Zebulon, those who have overcame and, uh, and God dwell in them, they were willing to jeopardize their life. Yahshua was willing to lay his life down for his brethren. You have to be willing to lay your life down for him so you can get peace, so you can be delivered from captivity. You know what I'm talking about? See, we not, they, Hebrew, Hebrew don't teach us about being delivered from the true captivity, which is death and sin. Verse 38, y'all. Make it 36. That sounds better. He says, Then come Yahshua with them unto a place called Jessamine, and said unto his disciples, Sit ye here while I go pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then he saith unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. Because that's going right back to what he said. He said, My soul full of troubles. My life drawn near to the grave. Just because he was the son of the living God, he was still in this infirm flesh. You think his flesh wasn't like this here? Boy, you finna die, boy. You finna die, boy. What's your flesh naturally going to do? I don't want that. What do you think happened when the word come and show you behaviors that are contrary to it. You act like a man who drowned. You kick and fight because you don't want to die. And you're going to have to look at it. For you to be saved, you're going to have to die. That's why the man told you he that saved his life is going to lose it. If you try to continue to hold on the ways that are contrary to God, the works that are contrary to God, the thought patterns that's contrary to God, you're going to lose your life. He said, but he that loses life, he's going to save it. If you give yourself up, that's the most hardest thing. That's what everybody don't want to do. They don't want to get out of the way. You don't want to get out the way. Because every last one of you, your own worst enemy, all you got to do is get out the way. Not like Ludacris said with the cuss word in it, but get out the way. That's all you got to do is just get out the way and let the Lord take over. Matter of fact, now that I mentioned it, look at Galatians. Look at Galatians. Galatians 2. Galatians 2 and 20. Matter of fact, make it 16. He said, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Yahshua the Messiah. That's what it takes. We know we can keep, what we remember when we dealt with them lamps. He said, you can have the lamp, with the book says the commandment, but if you don't have the oil, which is the spirit, which you get through faith in the light, which is Yahshua, it serves you no purpose. You know what I'm talking about? Because we already know what did our forefather Abraham had. He believed God and he was counted righteous because of it. And then through his belief in God, he said, this man kept my laws, my statutes, and my commandments. And that's where your justification come in at. See, this is where these people in these churches take it and they say, see, you ain't got to keep the law. No, he didn't say you didn't have to keep it. He just said, that's not going to justify you with this man if you don't believe in my son. Because there's many Israelites out here, oh, we don't deal with the New Testament. We Old Testament only. Okay, you keeping the commandment, but you're breaking the first one. And the first one, he told you in Psalm 2 and 12, you see how the Lord gets you? Kiss the son, lest he be angry and perish in the way. So you say you only deal with the Old Testament, but you disobeying the commandment right there. He told you to honor his son. Right there, he got you. 
See, the Lord get him either way. If you want to say you just want to deal in my epistle letter and in the gospel, okay, I can turn around and I'm going to get you there when you go contrary to me. You say you don't believe in the old New Testament, I'm only going to deal with the Old Testament, don't worry, I'll get you over here too. Because that's how it works. I'm going to get you. you either going to do all of it or you're going to get God. Because all this book line up, it's all the same word. It just takes skill and being able to see it. And not let, that's why the Lord say, I done told you now, don't let no man deceive you. There's a lot of false prophets going to be out here. I done told you. He just said, say, I done told you. See, I took that heavy when I seen it. When I was young, I, I didn't know what that meant. But I, I understood. That's a real mean warning. Because he didn't just say, it's false prophets. He said, nah, I done told you. And all I could think about was my mom. Oh, my auntie, I done told you now. And when they told me I done told you, that means they were dead serious about what they were talking about. Y'all got to be dead, be careful now. Nicola just tell you, man came to it talking about the word, didn't know what he was talking about. A lot of people can throw verses out. That don't mean they have understanding. That don't mean they know what he's talking about. Y'all got to be careful when people come at you just throwing verses out. You got to be like, say, hold on now. I need you to line that up. I need you to write and divide that. I need to be able to get this out of the mouth of two or three. If you show me something out of the New Testament, I need to see it out of the Old. If you can see, show me something out of the Old, I need to see it out of the New. And I need two or three witnesses so the matter is established. If not, I'm going to have to search that out. Well, can you write the scriptures down for me? I go home, I can search it out. Because when you really challenge people to stand on what they're teaching, what do most of them do? They retreat. Not all, but a lot retreat. Let's look back at what he said. He said, even we have believed in Yahshua the Messiah, that we may be justified by the faith of the Messiah and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Because you can't get the Spirit by keeping the commandment. You get the Spirit by the righteous obedience of faith. You can't get it by keeping the commandment. Because now you're saying that I earned that. You know what I'm talking about? But see, faith, that ain't something you can earn. That means you really trust and believe God. And a lot of y'all, you don't trust and believe God. You really, you read what he say. You hear what he say. But you really don't trust what he say. You might believe what he say, but you don't trust it. Because, see, you can believe something, but trust is something totally different. You know what I'm talking about? You can believe, oh, I know he's going to do that. But you don't really trust he's going to do it as it pertains to you. And that's why you're slack here and you're slack there. He say, for if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. So that's saying, if you done killed yourself or you done cast certain things away and then you try to go back to it, Paul just say, now you're a sinner. He's a sinner when you do that. He say, for I through the law am dead to the law that I might live under God. So he say, through the law, you dead to the law. Which is, what is that law? When you break God's law, what the law say supposed to happen? You're supposed to die. Remember, this man made himself a curse. He took on death to remove death. Meaning he took on, as we read that first John 3 and 8, he destroyed the works of the devil. I remove sin. Therefore, death is removed from you because you don't sin anymore. So, therefore, you have access to eternal life. Because where sin is, life is void. This is what it comes back to why the animals were sacrificed. It was showing forth that the blood of these animals would give you life. That's why he said, in the law specifically, I've given you the blood for atonement. The blood is life. That's what he was telling you about your Savior. The man came and shed his blood, and through that man's blood, you can get life. That's what he was telling you, he that drink my blood and eat my flesh, I'll raise him up at the last day. Because basically, you eat my words, you drink my spirit, you believe and you obey me, you have life through my sacrifice. Now, chill out, this thing. Now, look at verse 19, 20, I should say. He said, I am crucified with the Messiah. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but the Messiah live in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see what he just said? Say, I died with the Lord. That's what we were dealing with a couple weeks ago with baptism. When he said that's symbolizing you dying to the world and to the flesh. That's why some of y'all ain't ready to do it because you have not died with the man. He said, I mortified, I killed myself with him. And look what else he told me. He said, he lived, he said, but not I, the word lived in me now. He said, because of my faith and belief in this man, the word dwells in me, and I walk and live by the word now. I walk and live by my own lust, my own desires, my own way, my own thought. What did he say was wrong with Israel? He said, this is a stiff-necked people that go after their own way and their own thoughts, a way which is not good. Our way is not good. God's way is perfect. That's what Psalms 18 says. 
So if you see that this man got a perfect way, why wouldn't you walk in? Why wouldn't you walk in? I would want somebody to give me a rational explanation. That man, look and tell you, I have a perfect way. I have a way that will make you complete. I have a way that will make you whole. I have a way that will give you life eternal. And you don't walk in. What does that say about you? Let's sit there and just be real about it. What does that say about you? That you'll sit there and say, you know what? I don't want that. And you know what I'm going to look at you and say? You've got to be the dumbest nigga in captivity, literally. Because you already know how I feel like you mean you an ignorant, stupid individual. You know what I'm talking about? At a common point in time in your life, you just can't be stupid no more. All of them been stupid. Ain't an individual walking this earth if they done got over the age of 16 or 17 ain't been stupid. Some of them been stupid long before then. Some of us were stupid before we even hit puberty. You know what I'm talking about? But it got to come a time and point in your life. You can say, you know what? I just can't be stupid no more. Some of y'all ain't got to that point yet. I got to that point. I got to that point June 23rd, 2005. And I was talking about, and really I had been got to that point when the people say, hey man, you finna go to prison for five years. And I had already knew better. So that made it worse. See, ignorance is one thing, but when you know better, that makes it work. Y'all don't know how it feels to sit around your peers in prison. They looking at you, and you can sit down and talk to them, and they like, bro, what you doing in here? That makes you feel horrible, because they already know. They're looking at you like, bro, I know things real out here in these streets, but boy, you ain't supposed to be in here with us. You know what I'm talking about? they like, boy, you ain't supposed to be in here with us. That makes you feel extra stupid. You know what I'm talking about? Not that you think that you're better than them, but these men knowing your mind frame and mentality is not fit for this place. You know what I'm talking about? And sometimes we have a mind frame and mentality to think that we should be in places where we ought not to be. And surrounded with people that we ought not to be with. So the time got to come in, I just can't be stupid. Enough. I just can't do it. You know what I'm saying? You got to sit and think, I just can't be stupid no more. It ain't no shame to stand up and say, you know what? I've been stupid. You know what? And I'm not going to be stupid no more. I'm going to believe God and live by him. Look what he said in his last verse. He said, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then the Messiah is dead in vain. That was the whole point of where the people twisted that, because they just don't know it. Because he told you in Isaiah 53, the knowledge of my righteous servant will justify many. So your justification going to come in, you learn of the Son of God, you believe on the Son of God, you live by him. Not that you can do what you want to do. Because we all know that we discuss. Most of y'all got children. Y'all know y'all not going to let y'all children run in the house and do what they want to do. And then we think that the living God going to let us run around the earth, which is his house. He said the fullness of the earth thereof and everything in it is his. This man said he bought your body with his blood. He said your own butt don't belong to you. And you're going to think, oh, you can run around here and do what you want to do. That just flies in the face of common sense. But this is what men want to lead us to believe. We can't be stupid no more. That's all that is. What was that for then? What was that? Matthew 26, yeah. Yeah, but look at what he said in verse 39 here. He said, he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thy will. That's the mind every single last one I need to have. Not what you want to do, but what God say to And when you can get that type of mind in your head, that not what you want, but what he want, you can get yourself on point. Now you can get that type of mind in your head that when anything come up, the first thing pop in your head is, what do my father want? Not what I want, but what do he want? And then let his will be accomplished and not my own. You'll save your soul then. What about the song, Ed? Oh, that's why we came here. Now I remember. He said, verse 5 is where we at. He said, free among the dead like the slain that lie in the grave. Whom remember, whom thou remember no more, and they are cut off from thy hand. Thou hast laid me in the lowest pit, in darkness, in the deeps. Thy wrath lay hard upon me. Thou hast afflicted me with all thy ways. He says a lot. Now pause and consider. Now look what he said. He said he laid me in the, the lowest pit, in darkness, and his wrath laid on me. Let's look at Matthew 27. Let's see what the Lord said right here about verse 45. Matthew 27 and 45. Oh, 
You got 27 and 45. And it said, And now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Yahshua cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? So if he's sitting saying, God, don't forsaken him, he's knowing that affliction is on his head, is it not? He being afflicted. And he's saying that wrath lay hard upon me, because if he, if the wrath wasn't laying hard upon him, why would he ask, why have you forsaken me? But see, let's look at that something else that he told his disciples here in Matthew 16. This will make, make it clear. Matthew 16 and 20. He says, Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Yahshua the Messiah. He said, And from that time forth began Yahshua to show unto his disciples that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. This is going right back to what we're dealing with. He's been afflicted with all his ways. That ways with us, multitude of people came on and did. Did they afflict this man? Beat this man? We're going to deal with them, bind them up, all these things. Go back to Psalm 88. Look at verse 8, though. Because we know Yahshua was laid in the pit. Do we need to go read where they put him in the grave? Let's just read to put him in the grave verse, in chapter 27, just so somebody come by and just lay on and look at it. So they don't think we just made something up. And by verse 57 in Matthew 27, just because they don't think we just made something up. He said, when even was come, there came a rich man of Arithia named Joseph, who was also himself was Yahshua's disciple. He went to Pilate and begged of the body of Yahshua. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. When Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and he laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out of rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. So now we're sitting there looking at him that he laid him in the lowest pit, right? He put him in the grave. And you know darkness is going to be on you in the deep sense, in the grave, because you're going to be sleeping. Let's go back to Psalm 88 and look at verse 8. This is what he tells him. He says, Thou hast put away my acquaintance far from me. Thou hast made me an abomination unto them. I am shut up and I cannot come forth. Because Yahshua break through from the people. When he said his acquaintance, he said he put him far from me. We just already read the disciples fled. Time back to this 2 Kings 25 when he says his army was scattered from him. And all the men of war fled by night. Because when did they come get him? He said by night they fled away. See, we always got to remember, everything in, these, in this book, it's going to correlate back to the Lord if we got eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart to understand. Look at verse 9. He said, his, my eye mourn by reason of affliction. Yah, I have called upon, called daily upon thee. I stretched out my hands unto thee. And we know full well, it says that when he was praying, he was sweating. It looked like he was drops of blood. You think he might have not been crying knowing what was going to come on? You think ain't none of y'all, you think some of y'all would have been strong enough to know you were going to be killed beforehand and you weren't going to shed no tears? So you would have been jumping up and down like, yeah, boy, I'm going to get beat untold. I'm going to be hung from a tree for hours. And I'm happy about it. You don't mean that he didn't want to do it. You know what I'm talking about? But don't sit here and think you're going to be in the flesh and you think you're just going to be all strong about it. But now you're telling a lie. Verse 11. He says, shall thy loving kindness be declared in the grave, or thy faithfulness in destruction? Let's see if his loving kindness could be declared in the grave. Because what happened to the Lord? Let's look at Luke. Luke 24. Luke 24. I'll say about verse, uh, verse uh, 21. Make it 20. Matter of fact, we'll do verse 19. Might as well. Now, you know, the verses before that, he said, You are sure walking. The man said, Was sad. He asked him why he was sad. He said unto him, What things? They said unto him, Concerning Yahshua of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty indeed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we have trusted that it would be been he which should have redeemed Israel. And besides all this, today is the third day since these things were done. So they're saying they trusted that he would be the one to buy Israel back. Now we know if we go look in the law, it say if a man sell himself into bondage, that his brethren or his next kinsmen could redeem him. I think that's in this video, Redeem Without Money on the Jesus for True Freedom. So we're not going to go deep off into it. You know what I'm talking about? You go back and look at it. I think he might have been to the house when we did that. That was, that was almost a year ago. You know what I'm saying? But it says your near kinsmen could buy you back. And we know what the Yahshua buy us back with. Because he said you sold yourself for nothing. You'll be redeemed without money. 
So this man came and bought you back with his blood. What did he buy you back from? He bought you back from sin. That's what he came to buy you back from. Showing you what we started off in that song anyway. He said, you are the God of my salvation. Because Yahshua's name means what? Yah saved. So that's showing you for there's not a God that is called that is named God. There's just gods of men and there's lords of men. But of all the so-called gods that are mentioned that in heaven or in earth, there's one true and living God. His name is Yah and his son's name is Yahshua. That's the only God that can save. Not only can this man save you from afflictions in life or troubles in life, this man can save you from death. None of these other gods have that ability nor power. You don't hear that about Horus. You don't hear about that. They talking about, oh, you'll come back in the next life and be a and be a prick. That's what they teach you in Hindu, that Nirvana stuff. That's what they teach you. What they tell you, Allah say you come up in heaven, you get seven virgins. He ain't say nothing about you being redeemed from sin and death and living forever. He ain't say nothing about that. See how to sit there and consider all of that. Look what he said. He said, Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulchre. And when they had found not his body, they came saying that they had seen a vision of angels. Which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with, with us went to the sepulchre and found it, even so as the women had said, but him they saw not. And then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoke. You see, the Lord rebuked him and rebuked him swiftly. He said they were fools, and he said they were slow of heart to believe what this man, done, what the scriptures done told you. Let's see what the Lord did. He said, Ought not the Messiah to have suffered these things and enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses. And all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So now when he sat and did that, you know what he was doing? He was showing forth the faithfulness of God. He was showing forth the love and kindness of God. That's what he was doing. It couldn't be declared in the grave. He couldn't do it in the grave. So when he came up out of the grave, what did he just do? Because remember, he talked about his disciples fleeing from him in death. This ain't talking about him talking to us. Because he said that we would be able to be able to get into that prayer in John 17 when he said he was speaking to his disciples. He said, but all those that believe on you through your word, then we would enter them. You know what I'm talking about? And he didn't throw that in there in John 17 that he was speaking specifically to, the, to his disciples and the people of that time. But when he threw that in there, all those that believe, because guess what? You know the disciples had to teach people. And then the people that they taught, taught somebody, so therefore everybody got a way in. See, the Lord merciful now. He makes sure you get away in. Look at verse 44. In the very same chapter. And he says, And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you, while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the scriptures. And he, un and he said unto them, Thus it is written, Thus it behooves the Messiah to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. So he couldn't—he didn't profess that in the grave, did he? When he talked about repentance and remission of sins, isn't that the love and kindness and faithfulness of God? He's showing you that for. Because we already know the key thing. The man was sorrowful that he was going to die. When they came to snatch him, his disciples fled from him. He went in the grave. He said, now who's going to be able to declare your faithfulness and love in the grave? He said, I gotta bring you from up out of that end. And y'all bring you up out of there, it can be declared. Go back to Psalm 8. See, look at another thing he said in verse 12. I think there's another part where he says signs of wonders. Yeah, thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. I know right where it's at. Look at verse 12. In Psalms 88. He says, Shall thy wonders be known in the dark, and thy righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? He said, How can his wonders be known in the dark? Look at Mark 16, if I'm not mistaken. Mark 16 and 15. This is the key thing. Well, I thank the Lord. I'll be preaching it. Because this stuff like this, man, he give us an opportunity to know him. And he says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believe and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believe not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, and they shall speak with new tongues. So when he's sitting there looking at that, during that time, they showed them signs and wonders. Paul showed you that. They cast out devils. You know what I'm talking about? When he says speaking in new tongues, we know from Acts 2, speaking in tongues is speaking in another language. Because what they say about Paul uh, with Peter, he said, man, they drunk on new wine. He said, well, this ain't no new wine, man. He said, well, they speaking in all these. He said, we hear them speaking in our language. 
So when we hear people speaking in tongues, then they're not speaking in a in a in a, in a, in a uh, tangible language that we know. I got the wager. You ain't speaking in no tongues. Then the man told you, if ain't nobody around to interpret, you need to keep it to yourself anyway. Because some what he said, he said, somebody walk past you and hear you do that, they're going to thank you crazy. He said, it's better for you to prophesy. He said, because when you do that, a man can be convicted in his heart. And then he'll turn from himself and be saved. Look what else he said. This is what a dude just died from that. He said, they shall take up serpents. Silly dude had a TV show where he's picking up snakes and they biting it. But you guess what we just read last night? What he said, don't tempt y'all like you did in Massa. And what did the Lord tell Satan when he came and said, man, jump up off his mouth? He said, man, you don't tempt y'all like God. See, that's a dummy. That's how you know the Lord ain't son. You just don't grab no snakes and let them bite you. Talking about, this is how I'm going to show you the Lord with me. I ain't going to the hospital. You need to go to the hospital because you're a dummy. And I ain't talking about no regular hospital. You need to go to the middle hospital. For being a fool to pick up a snake and let it bite you. When Paul got bit by that snake, man, he didn't just go pick up a snake and let it bite him. He was sticking his hand to do something. The serpent snatched on to him. That's fulfilling what he said. These signs going to follow you. He said, if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them, and they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. And we could go read where Elisha had that happen, where there was death in the pot. Matter of fact, let's look at that. Second Kings. Let me find where that's at. It said it was death in the pot. Where it is. It's been a while since I looked at it. Might be chapter six. Let me see. No, I wasn't chapter six. It might be chapter thirteen. Hell, yeah, you can have not if you remember where it's at. It's been a good long time since I looked at that. I used to read about Alicia all the time. I just like how Alicia moved. See what it's at. See if he can help me out. You can find it over here somewhere. Give me a second. I know we've been sitting still for a good long while. I hope anybody bum went uh went numb. No? Yeah, you are. Uh, second Kings four. You got to take everybody else and start calling you. No. Okay. Second Kings four and about verse thirty-eight. I was looking right at it too. And it says, "And Elisha came again to Gilgal, and there was dearth in the land, and the sons of the prophets were sitting before him, and he said unto a servant, Set on the great pot and see pottage for the sons of the prophets." And one went out into the field to gather herbs and found a wild vine and gathered thereof wild gourds, his lap full, and he came and shred them into the pot of the pottage, for they knew them not. So they poured out for the men to eat, and it came to pass as they were eating of the pottage, that they cried out and said, O thou man of God, there is death in the pot. They could not eat thereof. But he said, Then bring meal. And he cast it into the pot, and he said, Pour out for the people, that they may eat. And there was no harm in the pot. And there came a man from Baal Shalisha. And brought the man of God bread of the first fruits, twenty loaves of barley, full ears of corn and husk thereof, give unto the people that they may eat. So that's the whole key thing. He said he brought the first fruits. So he brought the best things in there to get that stuff up out of there. That's what the Lord going to do to get that death out of the pot, which is the stuff that's in your heart. He said, and the servitor said, what should I set this before a hundred men? He said again, give the people that they may eat. For thus saith Yah, they shall eat and leave thereof. And so he said it before him that they did eat and left thereof according to the word of Yah. So it would make sense that the Messiah would come back and say, hey, it could be, uh, you could drink or eat a deadly thing and it's not going to touch it because it's already been prophesied or spoken of that this would happen. Because the man said, to say, it's death in the pot. He said, well, put these first fruits of your fruits and these corns and these husks in here and it get the death out. He was showing the protection of the, of the living God right then. Because all they cried out, they said, oh, man, of God is death in this pot. He said, don't worry about it. So I take it to the Lord. He'll handle that. That's why he told his disciples that. And you can sit there and see that because Paul went through. They say, man, ain't nothing wrong with that, man. Y'all good. See, that's when it comes. Did you see the people say, oh, man, why he did this to it? He said, they just went to the man of God and said, man, it's death in this pot. Call on the Lord for it. 
They didn't say, I'm going to call on it. They say, call on the Lord for it. He called on the Lord for him, and y'all made something happen. Because that's what he's going to do to those who serve and obey him. If you don't serve and obey him, he's going to do nothing for you. We're going back to, uh, let's go back to 2 Kings 25. So when we go back and look at this second Kings twenty five, y'all. And it says, and verse six is where we're at. It says, So they took the king and brought him him up to the king of Babylon to Ribala, and they gave judgment upon him. And they slew the sons of Zachariah before his eyes, and put out the eyes of Zachariah, and bound him with fetters of brass, and carried him to Babylon. Why is this important? Let's see if they gave him some judgment. Let's look at John 19, actually. John 19 first. Everybody all right? All good and quiet this afternoon. I wait to saw. You get no response. What did I say? John 19. John 19 and about, oh, pardon me, it's John 18 and about verse 30. Matter of fact, make it 28. It says, Then led they Yahshua from Cappius unto the hall of judgment, and it was earth. And they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went unto them, and said, What accusation bring you against this man? They answered and said unto him, If, it were not, if he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him up unto thee. So now they try to say this man was a criminal. Just sat there and told this man that he was a criminal. Then Pilate said unto them, Take ye him and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death, that the saying of Yahshua might be fulfilled, which he spake, signifying what death he should die. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Yahshua and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? So what is he saying when he said, Signifying the death he must die? Because he said he had to die at the hand of the Gentiles. Jews couldn't kill him. Let's look at Luke 24. Or 23. This is 23 that I want to see it in World War. No, let's make it Matthew 27. It could be Mark 15, actually. I'm looking for a specific word. Yes, it is. Mark 15 and 1. And it says in Mark 15 and 1, And straightway in the morning the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council and bound Yahshua and carried him away and delivered him to Pilate. So now we see that they bound Yahshua, just like they did with King Zechariah. They bound him and they carried him away to some Gentiles, just like they did with King Zechariah. They bound him up and brought him to Pilate. They bound up King Zechariah and brought him, to, uh, brought him to Babylon. But does anybody else know who else got bound up? I know I didn't ask all this before. Who know who else got bound up? Somebody answer it for me. I'll make sure y'all still breathe. Somebody answer it for me. Don't everybody answer at once. Now, who else got bound up? I see ain't nobody going to help me out. Well, that was Samson. That was Samson that got bound up. But he, all this was showing you is that this man was taken captive. Now we know he was taken captive for a reason. Let's look at Ephesians, the fourth chapter. Ephesians 4 and about verse... Uh, Verse 7, he said, but under us, every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of the Messiah. 
Wherefore he saith he have ascended up on high, and he led captivity captive, and gave gifts unto all men. So therefore he was able to lead captivity captive when he laid his life down. Now let's go look at something in the, in the laws of the sacrifice, and let's see that there. Because this man had to be taken captive by his enemies, and sacrificed, and brought from, to, from the dead, to be able to declare the faithfulness and love and kindness of God, which is deliver us from sin. Let's look at Leviticus 1 and 9. It's going to be much longer. We've been sitting here a good long time. I know that light is here, but we had a guest in here. That's why, that, before we got started, that's what, why we went through all these things, because we had to give us some clarification. I guess it would have been a little different if y'all had been present. Leviticus 1 and 9. Make it verse 6, 7, actually. It says, The sons of Aaron, the priest, shall put fire upon the altar and lay wood in, the, in order upon the fire. And the priest Aaron's son shall lay the parts, the head and the fat in order upon the wood that is on fire, which is upon the altar. But his inwards and his legs shall he wash in water. And the priest shall burn all on the altar to be a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto Yah. So when we look at this here, he's saying that this offering and this sacrifice, because when we look at the beginning here in verse 2, it talks about making burnt offerings. And when you look at this key thing is, he say after that there, they took the inwards out. And they washed it with water. They cleansed it. Look at Psalm 51. Psalm 51. Make it about verse 4. He said, Behold, I was shaping in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Because we were born in this flesh, so therefore we had to be we had to die. That's when he was referring to be shaping in iniquity. He said, Behold, thou desire, desire truth in the inward part, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Let's go right back with Paul say that uh you'll be washed by the water of the word. This man wants you to have his word dwelling in your heart, and that's what'll cleanse your insides out when you take heed according to his word. He say, Purge me with his hop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. He said, Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. That's the only way it's going to happen if you be able to, to offer yourself as a sacrifice. You see how he said it was a sweet smelling savor? Going back to how the Messiah offered himself as a sweet smelling savor. So you've got to do that to be able to offer that sweet smelling savor, that sweet aroma. You need to wash the inward parts. And that's what Yahshua came to do, showing forth that sacrifice. He was that burnt offering. And to give forth that aroma. Because he's going to look at it for you again. Just because I mentioned it, didn't read it spot for spot. Ephesians 5 and 1. He said, But be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as the Messiah also loved us and have given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. It's kind and right back in it. So you got to be willing to offer yourself and to wash yourself in the inward parts by letting the Lord wash you by the word. So that, therefore, you could be freed from the captivity. Because he took himself, he allowed himself to be taken in captivity that we might be free. That's why he said he that commits sin is of the devil. He said, but this is for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested to destroy the works of the devil. This man came to destroy that heart of stone and get it up out you, as Ezekiel told you. It's none of this stuff ain't new information for some of y'all, but sometimes it needs to be reiterated that you can understand to get free. The man came to give you liberty. He came to give you freedom. You can't have freedom when if you're still meddling with iniquity. Let's see, there was something I was looking for. It's just in my mind. And I done fell out. Give me one second. All right. Let's go on back here and deal with that again. One time for Second Second Samuel 18, verse 9. Because he had just posted this up the other day, last week. And it hit my mind. And I touched one of the things that he used on it. To go through this. This is when it came to my mind when uh, Ron was asking about them lots, and we mentioned Absalom. Verse 9. 
He said, Absalom, which means father of peace, met the servants of David. Absalom rode upon a mule, and the mule went under the thick boughs of a great oak, and his head caught hold of the oak, and he was taken up between the heaven and the earth, and the mule that was under him went away. And a certain man saw it and told Joab and said, Behold, I saw Absalom hanged in an oak. So when we go look at Acts, we see that this man is hung from a tree right now. Let's look at Acts. It might be chapter 4. You could use chapter 2. We're going to look at Acts 5. It could be Acts 13 that I desire this time. Let's go ahead and look at Acts 5 real fast. Then we'll come over here to Acts 13. And he says in Acts 5, about verse 29. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Yahshua, whom you slew and hanged on a tree. Him have God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. This is the whole purpose of what they're showing you. This man had to die to set you free. Absalom is showing you that same thing. His name being Father of Peace. We just started off reading about how Jerusalem is the city of peace and Yahshua was the prince of peace. And that he had to take captive what was taken away our peace, which was sin, that we might be able to have peace and dwell in this city. That we could be free. That we could be the inhabitants of the free city. Matter of fact, hold this Acts before we get to 13, Acts 13, and probably about verse 29. And look at this Ephesians 3. Actually, Galatians 4. That's what I want. Galatians 4 and about verse uh, 22. Galatians 4 and 22. He says, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was born of, born of, the, was of the bondmaid was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai which gendered the bondage, which is Agar, because that first covenant couldn't take away sin. It couldn't take death away, which therefore means you were in bondage to sin and death, not that the law was bondage. He said, for Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answer to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. So this is the whole key thing. Jerusalem is free. This is up there in heaven. There's no bondage in Jerusalem. There's no sin in the heavenly city. There's no sin in the city of peace. So therefore, those who are born of her to seek to dwell in her, to be dandled upon her knees, shall be free as well. Because we know no unclean thing and nothing that worketh abomination shall enter into the gates of the city. So for you to be able to enter into the gates of the city, you're going to have to get free. The man that took captivity captive. The work has been accomplished. The work has been done. It's on you now. It's on you now. It's all on you now. It's on you and what you desire. It's on you. How bad do you want to be free? How bad do you want to stay in the elements of bondage of the flesh in the world that you are not going to be able to dwell in Jerusalem? Go back to Acts 13. Acts 13, I say by verse 26. He said, Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, whoso among you fear God, to you is this word of salvation sent. For they that dwell at Jerusalem, and their rulers, because they knew not him, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they fulfilled them in condemning them. And though they found no cause of death in him, yet desired that Pilate that he should be slain. And when they had fulfilled that all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. But God raised him from the dead. And he said, and he, he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. We declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children. 
and that he have raised up Yahshua again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, no more return to corruption. He said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. That's freedom right there, because David ought to die for his sin. When David did that with Bathsheba, he declared death on himself. He said the man that did this, he should die. He said, that man is you. He said, but nevertheless, I put your sin away. And now knowing that we have committed sins worthy of death and that we ought to die, this man doesn't say, I done gave you the show of mercies. I done given you freedom. Knowing that this man has given you freedom, knowing that this man has given you the ability to be free from death, knowing that you have the ability to no longer be in this flesh and commit sin, it's time to get free. It's time to be quickened according to his word. It's time to leave things alone. It's time to leave places alone. It's time to leave thoughts alone. It's time to leave all the things that you did before this man called you to his mercies and to his salvation. It's time to leave them alone. Every last one of us need to understand that and know that. And not be caught up on so many trivial things that could cost us our life. Go on back to 2 Samuel and look at about verse 17. I ain't going to hold y'all much longer. It's almost 6 o'clock. He said, and they took Absalom and cast him into a great pit. Because after that, hold on. He walked down there where they hit him at. Going back over here to verse 11. And Joab said unto the man that told him, Behold, thou saw him. Why did thou not smite him there to the ground? I would have given thee ten shekels of silver and a girl. And the man said unto Joab, Though you were... Should I receive a thousand shekels of silver in my hand, yet not would I put forth my hand against the king's son? And our hearing the king charged thee, Abishai, and Ittai, saying, Beware that none touch the young man Absalom. And when Pell went through it, he said, what he said, Touch not my anointed. That's why the Lord said, What? He that delivered you to me have the greater sin. See, let's look at that, though. John 19. Let's look at what the Lord told you there. Because he say, well, he say offenses must come. John 19 and 11, or 19 and 10. He say offenses must come. He say, but woe unto them through who the offenses must come. Because see, Joab committed an offense. The king charged you, period, don't touch my son. Joab would have did it anyway. He say, then say if Pilate unto him, speak thou not unto me. Know, not, know thou that I have the power to crucify thee, and I have power to release thee? Yahshua answered, Thou could have no power at all against me except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee have the greater sin. So when we go back and look at this second Samuel, the man who Joab was speaking to, he had enough sense. He said, the king done charge me, don't touch this man. He said, and if I touch him, I got the greater sin. He said, I ain't going to do it. So he considered what the king commandment was. Back to second Samuel 19. 18, pardon me. Look what he said in verse 13. He said, Otherwise I should have wrought falsehood against my own life. For there is no matter hid from the king, and thou thyself would have set thyself against me. So let's see back and look at that. Let's go over here to Acts. He said he would have set God against him. Look at Acts 5, chapter 5 again. Acts chapter 5, about verse 34. He said, Then stood up there one in council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law, had a reputation among all the people, and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space. And he said unto them, You men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what you intend to do as touching these men. For before these days rose up Theodius, boasting himself to be somebody, to whom a number of men, about four hundred, joined themselves who were slain, and all as many obeyed him were scattered and brought to naught. So he said, they're telling you, you better be careful who you're listening to. Because he said, an old false prophet rose up, and everybody obeyed him, got brought to nothing, and was scattered. He said, after this man rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of the taxing, and drew away much people after him, he also perished. And all, even as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. And now I say unto you, refrain from these men, and let them alone. For if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest happily you be found even to fight against God. This is what this man was telling Joab. He said, I can't do that. I bring error unto myself. 
So you have to sit there and look at that. When you walk contrary to God's word, you bring in falsehood on yourself. And you find yourself to be happily fighting against God. Because the scribes and the Pharisees, that's what they found themselves doing, going against Yahshua. They were fighting against God. We have to look at this and don't make the same mistake. Look at Acts chapter 2 and 23. We have to learn not to make the same mistake. Because if you what he told Joab. He said, now if I would have did that, you would have set yourself against me. See, he had enough sense. He had enough common sense to know this. He sat back and considered what his king had told him. There's no, way, there's no way in the world I'm going to go against the king commandment and endanger my own life. Acts 2 and 22. He said, you men of Israel, hear these words. Yahshua of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and the foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. And that's what Joab had. He had a wicked mind because y'all don't even know. He told David, told Solomon before his death to kill Joab, didn't he? You remember that? You read that before? Solomon to kill him. See, go on over here to Second Chronicles. Y'all come over here to Second Chronicles. It might be First Chronicles. It might be Second Samuel. Let me make so. Yeah, he told him to take him on out. Here's my memory, sir. It definitely ain't Second Samuel. Huh? It came out the grave. That look a good set. Let me find where the spot at. Look at first thing. Stop that thing. Y'all give me a second. I don't know where pale that. I don't know if you can have that. Just bring it back to the middle where it's at. Huh? Hold on, I can't hear you. Oh man, y'all ain't heard too much of nothing I said the whole time. Hold on, y'all. This thing done died. Say that again, pal. One more time, it's on speakerphone, man. The headset done died. Say that again, the headset done died. That's why I ain't hear you. Oh, the headset died? Yeah, I ain't even know it. Yeah, I hear you. Oh, first, first king, chapter 2. Okay. I appreciate it. So it might have been most of this stuff y'all might not even hear. First king. Oh, I, I heard, we, we heard you when you Oh, okay. Well, thank the Lord. As long as you can hear the word. Yeah, I had this before. Yeah, I didn't even know the thing was dead. Say first king, chapter 5. Well, I keep saying. There we go. Yeah, I got to set up the rope. Let's look at it. Look what he said. He said, Moreover, thou know also what Joab, the son of Zerah, did to me, and what he did to the two captains of the host of Israel, Abner, the son of Nir, and unto Admasa, the son of Jephthah, whom he slew, and should the, shed the blood of war in peace, and put the blood of war upon his girdle that was about his loins, and in his shoes that were on his feet. He said, do according to thy wisdom, and let not his whole head go down to the grave in peace. Because not only did he kill two men that had did no evil, he killed his son too. Now we know Absalom was trying to usurp the throne and kill him and all, but this man didn't let it be known. There's blood on this man's hand. And what did he tell Solomon to do? Execute judgment, didn't he? He said, don't let this man's gray hair go down to the grave in peace. So if he couldn't go to his grave in peace, what would that make him? Make him wicked, wouldn't it? So this is the same thing, because that's what Joab do. Joab sitting here talking about killing the king's son, knowing the king say, don't touch my son. Let's go back over here to the second time. Who's that looking at? Act 2. No, let's look at Acts 4. Hey, little thing. You're feeling a little better, man. Hey, little thing. You want that button? I ain't got no truth for you. Acts 3, actually, I meant. I don't have any tricks to it. Acts 3 and about verse 13. 
He said, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, have glorified his son, Yahshua, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you. Somebody posted that today. And people still living like that, too. Some of y'all were still called for Barabbas right now. Remember how dad used to, we used to clown on that all the time? We want Barabbas! A lot of black folks right now to this day. Y'all will scream that out right now. You'll rather have a murderer. You'll rather have a sinner delivered unto you than to have the living God. You got to consider that. These people call for a murder. These people call for a murder. He say, and killed the prince of life whom God raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And, and, and his name through faith is this, is in, 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 in his name through faith in his name have made this man strong. And see, that's how y'all going to be able to be made strong. To be able to be set free is through faith in his man's name. He said, whom you see and know, yea, the faith which is in him have given him his, this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And what did Isaiah tell you? He that mind is stayed upon them, he'll keep thee in perfect peace. How do you think y'all going to get If your mind is not stayed in believing in the name of the Son of the only of the living God. That's how you're going to get free. That's how you're going to get soundness. That's how your inward parts can be washed and be made clean. That your burnt offering can be a sweet smell and savor. It's simple as that. Sometimes we make certain things too difficult than what they need to be. With, with, with the aside, it's straight simplicity. It's not hard. Like we were speaking earlier with the sister who was here. All you got to do is get out of the way. That's all you got to do. Just move out of the way. Listen what you say. And now, brethren, I walk through ignorance. You did it as did your rulers. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all the pro prophets, that the Messiah should suffer, he have so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. And when the times of the refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. That's all he's sitting there telling you. Please repent so you can be changed. And your sins will be blotted out. When your sins are blotted out, you're free. you no longer in captivity. This man was taken into captivity for a reason. Don't think that story about King Zechariah was just for no reason. Yeah. They didn't just speak about his army fleeing and him being surrounded by men with weapons. And to be taken and bound and led captive. That was testifying of your Savior. Now this man was led captive so he could free you from captivity. Look at Hebrews 2 and 15. Huh? Do my from good to sleep. And fresh my from this crib. Look at it. Look at it. That's all right. Make it 14. Yeah. He said, yeah. for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also like himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had power over death, that is the devil, and deliver them through who fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So this man took on death, and for him to be killed, he had to be taken captive by his enemies. So now this man did all of this so we could be free. You should be rejoicing in your God. Yeah, you might feel bad about certain things that might be pricking your heart and coming to mind by what you've done or what you're doing or what you think about doing. But sit back and rejoice in your God and know you've got out. you got an out. you got a way out. You have an opportunity at freedom. you got people sitting here saying, oh, we in these people land. How can we be free? Say, I'm going to sit there and I'm going to leave that to an idiot. Because we want to be free from sin. We ain't worrying about being free in this land. It's not my land anyway. I don't care. This is not my government anyway. I don't care. Let these sinners do what they want to do. It's soon to be destroyed. I don't care what they do. I got freedom. And that freedom is in the Lord. He said, I got freedom. He said, we already read last week, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is liberty. You should be seeking liberty. We ain't talking about that liberty and justice for all like these, these heathens and these hypocrites talking about. We talking about true freedom. That's why my sister named that channel back. Because Jesus is the only way you're going to get true freedom. Y'all sure the only way you're going to get true freedom. You don't care nothing about having no right to vote. You don't talk about because you got some land, you can grow some crops. Because you got your own school. Because you got your own banks. Own hospitals. Does that make you free? Any of y'all think that's going to make you free? You think that'll make you free because you got a hospital? These sinners in America got hospitals. Are they free? Them sinners in Arabia got hospitals. Are they free? So you got to know, that ain't going to make you free. We talking about we want freedom from sin. Stop. We want freedom from death. 
And the only way we can get it is through belief and obedience in the words of the living God. It's the only way we're going to get it. And he came to deliver you from it. He came to cleanse your inward part. He's through his captivity. He came to set you free. Let's finish this up in 2 Samuel. I know we've been sitting for a long time. Said this little mother, she was going hard at the beginning. By the time we got in, she had been broken. I thank the Lord for it. Look at verse 14. Then said Joab, I may not tarry thus with you. And he took three darts in his hand and thrust them through the heart of Absalom while he was yet alive in the midst of the oak. And the ten young men that bear Joab's armor compassed about and smote Absalom and slew them. And Joab blew the trumpet, and the people returned from pursuing after Israel, for Job had held back the people. So when you can sit there and look at it, the people were pursuing after Israel too. But after a while, they stopped pursuing after them, didn't they, when they gave all the power to them. And they went there, they didn't thrust him in the heart, but they certainly hit him in his hands and in his eye, didn't they? So they used darts, what they hit him with, a spear, didn't they? Pissed him with nails. All right. All right, now when we look at verse 17, he's saying, They took Absalom and cast him into a great put pit in the wood. And laid a very great heap of stones upon him, and all Israel fled, every one to his tent. Now Absalom in his lifetime had taken and reared up for himself a pillar, which is in the king's dale. For he said, I have no son to keep my name in remembrance. And he called the pillar after his own name, and he called it unto this day Absalom's place. Now we see they put this man in the pit, right? And then they put stones on him. So that's going along when we read about Daniel being put in the lion's den, they put a stone on him. We read about when Songs of Solomon talking about right, putting a stone on a fountain, and it brought forth water, and we see Absalom bringing forth the same thing. Because we didn't already read about Yahshua raising from the dead, so you see him being put in the grave to be able to declare that faithfulness and love and kindness that we read in Psalms 88. Well, now when we look at verse 18, he said, He doesn't have a son to keep his name in remembrance. Well, we just read what Paul said today, You, my son, I have begotten thee. See, let's look at uh, 1 John 5 and 21. Because now the name, now we know he said the name of Yah is his name forever as a memorial. But we know Yahshua coming into the earth, that's a remembrance of the name of Yah forever. He said, I didn't have a son to leave my name in the earth. So he said, I got to leave a son down, send my son down here so I have a name in the earth. 1 John 5 and 20. He said, we know that the Son of God has come and have given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. And that we are in him, that is true. Even in his son, Yahshua the Messiah, this is the true God and eternal life. That's freedom. Because through understanding what? You're free from death, right? He said, you lack understanding, you were to death. Now you know the son of God is coming. He done came to free you. Because he said, I have no son to give me a remembrance in the earth. He said, so I call the place Absalom's place. Jerusalem is the city of peace. Yahshua is the prince of peace. You just heard him call him the prince of life. He's the ruler of peace. And what did he tell us? You come unto me, I'll give you rest. So when we look at Solomon, whose name is Shal Shalomo, or Shalom, which is rest or peace. Absalom name being the father of peace. All these things testify to this man. Jerusalem, the city of peace. All these things testify that Yahshua came to give you peace. He said, I set up a pillar. He said, I call it Absalom's place. Isn't Jerusalem the city of the great king? Ain't that what Yahshua told you in Matthew 5? Isn't it all of our desire to dwell in Jerusalem, to dwell in peace, to dwell in rest? As we were talking about earlier, Muffin with the Savage? Ain't that our desire? Who here don't desire to have peace? We'll just show you that one more time. John 16. It might be 14. Let's just make sure that you know that. Though. Make it John 14 to the first. We call it today, man. Let's use the clock. That's Luke 14. John 14 and 1. He said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So this man sitting there telling you, I got a place for you, didn't he? This man said, I go to prepare a place for you, an Absalom's place. 
in the Father of Peace place in Jerusalem. I come to prepare a place for you. All you got to do is believe and trust in me. I have a place for you. Verse 27 of this very same chapter. He says, peace I leave with you. So he says, shalom I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world give, I give unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Y'all need to sit down and understand that. That's why I say one of the fruits of the Spirit is peace. If the peace of the living God is in you, you have no need for your heart to be troubled. You have no need for you to be afraid. But the reason that your heart troubled you afraid is because you're doing things you ought not. You commit in sin, you walk in iniquity, you disbelieve in God, you constantly and consistently violate the man's word, and you wonder why things can't go how you want them to go. You wonder why you can't get no peace. You wonder why the Lord steadily kick you in your behind every cut and corner when all you got to do is just release. Just let it go and be free. That's all you got to do. That's all you got to do. Get out of the way. Let's look at Psalm 25. Well, thank you. Why you smell like food tonight? What you mean? Even that thing. Verse 8. Psalm 25 8. Matter of fact, make it verse 4. Matter of fact, verse 3. He say, Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Let them be ashamed with transgress without cause. That's going back to when we were going through that lake of fire. He said, Those that will be ashamed without cause, those are those that sin for no reason. Sin because they want to sin. But he said, Those that wait on you, he said, Don't be he said, Don't let them be ashamed. We already know anybody that believes and trusts in God is not going to be ashamed. He says, Show me thy ways, O Yah, teach me thy path. Lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. That's what Yahshua will come and tell you to do. He said, Where well, I am, my servant going to be. He said, I didn't come to call sinners to repent, uh, righteous to repentance, but sinners. I came to teach sinners in the way. Paul told you that. So he came to lead you in the truth that you might be free. He said, remember, O y'all, thy tender mercies and thy loving kindness, for they've ever been, been ever of old. What did they say about the Lamb of God? That he was slain from the foundation of the world. So that means the loving mercies and kindness of God has been since the foundation of the world. It was just manifested in these last times for us. Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions, according to thy mercy. Remember thou me for thy goodness sake, O Yah. Good and upright is Yah, therefore he will teach sinners in the way. That's why he say, for God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son. Because God is upright, me blameless. So therefore, if you can't lay no blame at my feet, I'm going to make sure that I teach sinners in the way. You'll have no excuse. You'll have no excuse. Matter of fact, look at Ephesians, the fourth chapter. Ephesians 4 and about verse 19. Well, bigger 18. Then we'll go to Act 3. Son, Act 3 came in my mind as well. Having the understanding dark and being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over under lasciviousness to work all uncleanliness with greediness, but he have not so learned the Messiah. See, this is what he came to do. The Messiah didn't come to teach you to commit sin. He came to teach you to stop. See, look what he tell you, what Peter tell you in Acts 3. That's what we have to look at. If we still commit sin, is the problem with the word, is the problem with the teacher, or is the problem with you? Because at the end of the day, I think you're going to have to look at yourself. Verse 24. He said, Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after. As many have spoken, have likewise foretold in these days. We just read about it with Zechariah and King. You just read about it in Absalom and Second Samuel. They were testifying of these things. Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first, God having raised up his son Yahshua, sending to bless you, and turning every one of you from his iniquities. This is what he sent this man to do, to teach you to turn. Because for you to be turned from your iniquity, don't you got to walk in the path of God? What you say there, Mother? Let's go back to Psalm 25 so we can be done. Psalm 25. 
You was able to hear the bike there, or you was punch drunk? I ain't trying to make so I know you ain't feeling well. We don't want you to contaminate us. He said, the meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. He said, those that are humble, they can be able to be taught. That's why the master told you, he that humbleth himself as a little child shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. If you can't humble yourself, this man cannot teach you in the way. And he can't guide you in his judgment. He's not going to be able to do it if you cannot be humble enough to obey him. If you still got pride in your heart and saying your way is best, what you want to do is best, he's not going to be able to guide you. He's not going to be able to do it, which means you're going to continually be in bondage. He said, all paths are of Yah are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. That's grace and truth in John 1. They said, we can go too in-depth. We're doing, go real in-depth another time. But that's that grace and truth. Right there in John 1. And he said, he'll show that to those that keep the testimony and that keep his covenant. And we already yeah. dealt with earlier this afternoon. If you don't keep his covenant, you curse. You're going to have a serious problem on your hands. He said, for thy name's sake, O Yah, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. We didn't already read. Yahshua say, preach his name beginning at Jerusalem for the remission of sins. We didn't read that this afternoon. Do y'all see things continually pointing to this man coming to remove your sin, to remove you to be free from death consistently? So get yourself free. He said, who, what man is he that fear Yah? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. His soul shall dwell at ease, and his seed shall inherit the earth. And we know what that man who is who feared y'all. We read it last night. Y'all sure feared his father. And he taught him in the way that he saw fit to choose him. And those who are born of him do what? They inherit the earth. They're born of God. You're born of the seed. You're born of God. You don't sin. You're going to inherit all the inheritance of a son. He said the secret of y'all is with him that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. That secret is the mystery of the Messiah. That covenant is, is the sanctified spirit. The Ruach Kodesh, the Holy Ghost. That's the secret. Pull your skirt down, woman. You're not a whore. What are you doing? Y'all understood that? That's good enough, though. I appreciate it. Now, we ain't going to go no further. But y'all.